Good morning. I'm Paula Ray. I'm with Verizon Business, which is the combined entity of the former MCI and Legacy Verizon Large Business Division. I'm located here out of Dallas, but I do have a, a passion and a fondness for New Orleans. And I had uh, a little time on my hands over Christmas, and I thought, well, what do I feel passionate about that I could submit to NANOG? So I'm here to talk about Hurricane Katrina and its telecom impacts and opportunities. Uh, I'm in MPLS product management and product development for Verizon. And I hope to make this a little interactive. It kind of reminds me of church. Here in Texas, we have really big churches, so I might even take a donation for New Orleans when I'm done here. So here's the agenda that I'll be talking about. Just again, to level set, I'll, I'll recap about Hurricane Katrina very briefly. I will dive in a minute or two on the telecom impacts, just for those that haven't followed it maybe as closely as I have. And then I would like to thank all the service providers, equipment providers, and ISPs that contributed to the rebuilding and restart of New Orleans. It's a many year effort, and many um, firms contributed to that. I will actually spend the bulk of my time talking about business continuity planning. Whether you realize it or not, everyone here in this room is actually part of the telecom infrastructure. And, well, certainly if you're in the U.S., the Department of Homeland Security views you as critical to the survival of this country. And we'll see what happened in New Orleans and maybe what we, what we can all take away and learn from. And if I had time, I would cover three case examples, but I believe I will not have time. But I will be um, sitting on the panel and can answer questions when I'm done. Oh, goodness. The specified network name is no longer available. Doesn't sound good. Hey, that's a happy thing. I have done a little prepping, but I can't do a blank screen. <laughs> Yeah, uh, but I can tap dance. I'm sure we have a few network engineers. Well, we've lost the network. We've lost the wireless. It, it, uh, this, this is authenticated, right, this laptop? I no. <laughs> no, that's, that's what uh, Golf House learned. Well, we Don't call FEMA. Yes, exactly. Don't call FEMA. Oh, I'm sorry, we can't help you. We, government can't help the commercial industry put stuff back together. Yes, I haven't seen it. I believe it's coming out later today, but the, I think the House of Representatives is going to release a scathing report today that talks about a failure to lead and a failure to help. Um, that won't talk so specifically about the telecom impacts, but I believe um, the FCC has an impartial committee that's looking at that. For those that aren't aware, after um, with the World Trade Center 9-11 um, event, there was like a McKinsey report that was an impartial you know, 92-page report that talked about all the lessons learned, and I would hope that for Katrina we would have something impartial and, and deep like that. When you say FCC, you mean the uh, Telecom Sector Coordinating Council? If I said it wrong, I meant FCC, oh. the Federal Communications Commission. So how many people here have ever been to New Orleans? Some number. I've been there many, many times. I actually had an opportunity to go there for business just last month. And you might think after five and a half months that it would be ready to go. I just didn't know really what to expect. Um, and it was really like a war zone still. Um, has anyone else here had a chance to be in New Orleans in the last couple of months at all? I would expect not. Um, this was like a disaster recovery kind of training session. Um, instead of tap dancing, I'll, I'll fill a few minutes here. So um, my observations after going there uh, just three or four weeks ago, you, you had neighborhoods that were completely gone, nothing left. So of course, no one living there, probably no capital investment in telecom and a holding pattern at that point. Then you had other neighborhoods that had, yay, um, had houses that were remaining with like every sixth one condemned, but no power and no one living there. And it's eerie, um, you know, I don't know what movie it might remind me of, but you, you don't often see a neighborhood that's like 12 streets by 12 streets with no one living there, no dogs barking, no kids, no cars, no sound whatsoever. It's silent when there's no one living there, and it's like a movie set. That's what it actually reminded me of. But anyway, let me kind of advance. I think I covered that. So in terms of my disclaimer, I will not be dissing anyone here in this room. 
I will be, you know, applauding all the contributions of our industry. I will be dissing maybe state, local, and federal government, but that's not the purpose of me being here. I will also say that I had a chance to talk with the hundreds of Verizon engineers and technicians that were on loan to Bell South. That's somewhat more of a copper dial tone kind of view, but I, I will um, kind of share some of those observations because it was pretty horrific. And, and the people volunteer for the job, so it's sort of like being, you know, in Iraq probably. Maybe not as bad. Um, let me talk about the critical infrastructure. These are all the things that we need as a community or as a country to survive. If you would have asked someone, say, 20 or 30 years ago, what is considered critical infrastructure, it would be sewer and it would be water and it would be everything the government owns and controls. Now, the Department of Homeland Security, DHS, considers all the things that are primarily privately held to be part of that critical infrastructure. So about 80% of what we call the CI is actually owned by oil companies, oil and gas companies, telecom companies, high tech, etc. So very small percent is actually controlled by the government. So that means that um, interdependence with private and, and government partnerships. You can see the picture of the dominoes. The reason I have that is I'll talk more about this, but when you're in a global village like ours and you're also IT independent, we're, we're all you know, related. We're in that same boat. And what happens in the Gulf can affect other parts of the country, and what happens overseas can affect us, et cetera. So um, it, it's kind of a domino effect, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. Of course, today I'm really here talking about telecom. So just as a recap, of course, New Orleans is the 35th largest city in the United States. Um, it it uh, transports or processes about half of all the grain exports coming out of the U.S. And in terms of ports, it's the fifth largest port, which I actually I'm not, wasn't too aware of. So also from a Department of Homeland Security perspective, they wanted to make sure that the things going on with Katrina didn't uh, kind of leave a hole in our zipper around the U.S. and allow maybe terrorists to come in while we were, you know, paying attention to some other things. So again, um, over a million residents in the city of New Orleans. I decided to kind of focus on New Orleans just, you know, to, to, to provide some sense of focus for myself, but the Gulf overall is, is hard hit as well, Biloxi, et cetera. And to, to, you know, maybe it's easy for us to play, you know, after the fact, you know, assessor and say they should have done more, coulda, shoulda, you know, woulda. But if you look at this geographically, Katrina affected um, 250 miles in terms of its scopes. So that would be the size of Scotland, Ireland, and part of Great Britain. So, you know, you really can't predict if somehow you wake up and the next morning, you know, three countries are gone. So I, I wanted to kind of put that into perspective. Um, in terms of the, the basic facts, again, we probably are aware of all this. The hurricane hit very, very early on the morning of the August 29th. Um, they have buoys that are, are out in the Gulf of Mexico, and these buoys tracked storm surges of 50 feet. And I don't know how many, like, stories that is, but I'm sure that's two or three or something like that. By the time it came ashore, and I'll show you a map of where it came ashore and what that did to the telecom infrastructure, um, it was about 20 to 22 feet. But again, um, in terms of maybe business planning in the city and so forth, they might have had some things on stilts, some things on second floors, but that's pretty substantial, 22 feet, and that's a lot, a lot of water. Um, if you may recall from the news and so forth, right after Katrina hit, there was this sense of euphoria, and you saw people like clapping in downtown New Orleans because they were so excited that the Category 5 didn't really happen, but within about 12 hours, the levees broke in three places. So that's what we call a secondary failure. So you had the hurricane, and that definitely affected a lot of people. That brought a lot of water ashore, wind damage, et cetera. I'm not minimizing that, but maybe if that had been the only disaster, that would have been one thing, but we had this domino effect of the levees. And those levees, um, for those that aren't aware, are, are 50 to 80 years old. So they've been band-aided as much as they can. And of course, there's been a lot of reports where um, money was requested to update and repair them, and, you know, PBS had had articles or stories about the big one coming, and of course, really what happened is what was predicted. So um, over a 1,000 fatalities in Louisiana, and uh, unfortunately, still 2,500 people missing and unaccounted for at this point. So here's the map. Um, this uh, white area down here. Uh, See where my pointer is. I'll have to get my better pointer. Uh, 
Okay. Right there. I saw it's kind of little. Um, this white area is actually the Gulf of Mexico. Um, this is Lake Pontchartrain. So when the levees broke, 50% of that lake basically went into those uh, parishes or counties that are below it. The two counties that are most hard hit are St. Bernard and Plaque Mines Parish right here. Um, for those that have been in New Orleans, that would be right here in this blue area right about in the middle. And I'll, I'll show you some pictures again from down here, this like Italian boot. So um, again, I don't have time to dive into all of this, but each parish is sort of like a little mini government. You know, it's a county. And so they would make their own, you know, fire and police decisions on equipment, frequencies, kind of do their own thing. And again, just like uh, September 11th, we saw somewhat uh, the, the problems with that because, of course, you had different equipment, different providers, lack of interoperability, different frequencies. So uh, clearly they need to be working more closely together. So in terms of the telecom impact, almost 2 million dial tone lines out in the New Orleans area alone. The unfortunate thing is that the phone number you would most want to call and have someone advise you, help you, tell you what to do, the emergency 911 centers called PSAPs or public service answering points, one third of them in the state of New Orleans were completely out. No people, underwater, no backups. It's a very um, unfortunate situation. and. That's actually the conference I was at a couple of weeks ago, so they have a lot of key learnings to do on their side. Um, a thousand cell phone towers out, um, and I don't have—I didn't bring the pictures, but I'll show pictures of more central office view. But cell phone towers fell over, submerged in water. Broadcast towers, and in fact, um, one of the big um, publishing houses or, or uh, broadcast companies here in Dallas called Belo, uh, they do a zillion papers, but they're one of the sole broadcast stations that were able to stay on the air throughout Katrina to advise people on what to do if they had power. Um, and then two toll switches were out, so um, if you wanted to get traffic to the next ladder or out of your state, um, I don't know if that was possible without some of those toll switches. And then if, for those that may not be able to see past all the heads in the front, um, all, all the, um, you know, the Lex and the providers would have had backup generators, but you typically don't have 14 days of backup generator power. You might have four hours, you might have eight hours, maybe you have a day, but eventually you're, you're not going to have enough, you know, juice. And um, the other thing is with that lake flooding, you, New Orleans basically became even more of an island than it is, you know, with everything in place. So anyone who was on the island, you know, in their home, in a resident there, was stuck there. Anyone that lived in the suburbs, which would be, you know, a zillion people, couldn't get into the island because you may have seen the picture of the bridge that looked like someone had taken a knife and slid it into four parts, so that bridge was destroyed. Then the 26-mile causeway, because of course there's a lot of water around New Orleans anyway, the 26 miles had to be inspected by the Army Corps of Engineers, and it took four days to inspect every inch of that to make sure that you're not just putting a bunch of fire trucks onto the bridge going to go into the ocean or, you know, whatever. So that's a very unfortunate situation. So that's that web of interdependence that I talked about where what, um, what affects, you know, one entity or, or industry affects others. So again, without that critical power, it, it affected a lot of things. And, and the other thing is if, if you've ever been involved in any disaster drills or preparedness kind of things, they always show a picture of someone with, you know, like the flake, fake blood dripping and like a nurse or someone helping. Well, in this case, you might have had 20 people needing help but because the nurses and the doctors were in the suburbs or whatever, couldn't get in to help. So y you had a total shortage of people able to come in and help or, or even like hourly workers t to do all the public services, like you know, serve you in a restaurant or take care of your hotel or whatever. So the, the hourly workers have just left the city, um, maybe never to return. So here's some of the pictures. Um, I apologize if these are hard to see, but. Let me use my better pointer. So this top CO is the lake CO, and I'm sorry, this little red dot is kind of small. So again, totally submerged um, uh, under you know 20 probably feet of water. Um, I'll have to look a little more closely, but I think there was a little building next door to it, and the little one-story building is completely covered. These are um, the Venice and Burress CO. So if you remember that little boot that I showed you, the, this is sort of the worst case scenario. So this is where the storm came ashore. So, uh, no, I, saw, I saw a better picture from uh, Bell South that showed one of their uh, COs that was on stilts that was blown away. Yes, yes. It wasn't there anymore. 
Right. So, so uh, there, there, um, this is public information that um, 19 COs are, are totally destroyed. So, uh, again, I, I should also say, I'm, you know, we all know people in the industry. I didn't call my friends to get the scoop. I have to use public domain information because, again, I'm not here to point a finger at any, you know, service provider or carrier. You, you know, Verizon had its impacts as well. So, again, this is where the stor storm came ashore and it um, takes a lot to rebuild those COs. Um, I, too, also took a little bit of a hit with their carrier, so they were out for about 10 days, but, you know, relative to the disaster, pretty quickly up, so um, my hat's off to them. Um, fiber down because, of course, it was attached to one of the bridges. And some of the emerging technologies really played a key role, so um, the terrestrial communication was pretty much out of commission for 72-plus hours with Katrina and even longer, you know, for, for copper. So WiMAX and VoIP, I think we've all seen, you know, or can replay in our mind the picture of Ray Nagin, the mayor of New Orleans, talking to President Bush on a VoIP connection. But I give a green light overall to the public Internet, to the commodity Internet. The vision of the public Internet, which is interconnected routers, where if you took one or a region away, it keeps going and it works seamlessly, that, of course, worked like a charm. Um, I don't have time to go through all these successes. But I did want to just touch on, you know, really, my hat's off to Bell South. I don't, I believe we were going to try and get someone for the panel, but I, I don't know if they were able to come in. But um, a monumental effort, just a sizable Herculean effort on their part. And I would estimate that it's a three to five year rebuilding effort. But uh, again, everyone helped, AT&T, SBC, Singular as well. People sent money, donations, donated people. Cisco also sent up, uh, you know, equipment and voicemail stations. Cox also helped with some of the shelters. And of course, uh, satellite phones took a huge increase. So I believe they overnighted 20 to 50,000 phones, primarily to first responders, which is your fire and police and mandatory government officials. MCI, now part of Verizon, also contributed. And um, Nortel and Sprint, of course, donated millions of dollars. Let me um, just give some observations from the uh, techs and engineers that I talked with. Um, all the uh, LEC carriers have mutual aid agreements, which is basically in a natural disaster, we will all help each other out. And so on September 10th, Verizon sent 200 people that raised their hand and volunteered and said, I will leave in, live in a tent for eight weeks and I will help out and I will have maybe some food and I'll maybe have two pairs of clothes and I will do that and help out. And they, the, to the person, everyone I talked to said they would do it again. Um, and, of course, because they had trucks and transportation where no one else did and they had fuel, they had armed guards with them every hour. So that's something I don't really have every day. I don't have to think about my survival and my safety, but these people did, you know, and I forget which one is which, but either crocodiles and alligators, you know, around, water moccasins, et cetera. And because of, you know, Verizon's expertise, I, I wasn't able to find, let's say, like any frame relay guys. I, I wound up talking to you know, copper and cable splicers and so forth. But, um, and again, I feel this is, you know, pretty obvious, but if you have a CO that's completely underwater, well, the cable vaults are destroyed. So they basically took a backhoe, chopped all that out, and started all over. So in 8, 12, 16 weeks, rebuilding a central office the best they could. In the suburbs, which was less hard hit, they might have had roof damage, they might have uh, some of the DSL pedestals, you know, run over, et cetera. Um, more like remedial replacement of DSL. Not, not to like put in a new DSL, they're not doing any new like construction or activity, just putting people kind of back where they are. But um, when I was in downtown New Orleans um, in January, I saw Verizon trucks still, I saw SBC trucks, I saw, you know, people laying fiber and cable and Cox cable everywhere, so it's still getting back on its feet. Oops, I think I paused too long. Well, expect the unexpected. Heck fire. I'm sorry? Uh, I'm trying with this thing. It has a little hourglass. I don't know if you can see that. So you want the page after this? Or yes, I, I would like the page after this. Okay, then just manually it would be this. <laughs> yes. I saw the um, the CEOs underwater, and I'm wondering if you could 
say, in a perfect world, uh, you could imagine an infrastructure that would have supported dealing with this type of disaster. For example, do you think the CEOs that are going to be put in New Orleans are going to have all critical infrastructure above sea level? Um, the, and I, I can't translate miles into feet, but New Orleans is two miles below sea level. So I don't know how many feet that two is. Two miles? I don't think so. But parts of it are, definitely. Two miles? Two miles below sea level. Okay, well, uh, that's the facts I had. If I'm wrong, I apologize. But um, I, I did actually have in this pitch Okay, well, that does sound co like quite a bit. But um, um, Definitely below sea level. I'll grant you that. Yes, yes, I'll, I'll grant you that. Because um, I actually did have an elevation map in this pitch before it got trimmed back. And um, uh, the greater part of Louisiana is kind of reclaimed land, like, like Holland would be. But um, I guess, you know, again, I'm not trying to second guess or point a finger, but yes, if, if maybe you have a one-story CO, maybe it really should be two or three stories, and unfortunately, um, a lot of the cable vaults were in the basement. That's somewhat a common thing from 50 years ago. So if, if, if all these COs in the future, if they were um, above sea level, that would include the power uh, backup generators and, and everything would be um, Yes, but there wouldn't necessarily be 14 days worth of power. I, I mean, I, I, I want to be clear that even with maybe better planning, better, you know, this, that, it's not going to be perfect like it didn't hurt. It, it could just be not as bad, right? I mean, because this is a catastrophic event. I, I, I definitely see it that way. Um, but, but I think there's some things that could have been done differently. And, and I think, you know, if, if you start with the root cause, you have to look at the levees, right? It's, it's not, you know, whether any industry should have done something a little, you know, better 50 years ago. It's, it's the levees and the water and, the, you know, that kind of thing. Another question? Randy Bush, IJ. Um, I missed in the infrastructure story the bit where some of the first stuff in there and that was available fairly widely was community-based Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. and, and could you speak to that? Because that was in there very early, very up, and very widespread. I think it depends on right at first how you define that, because I would think that within a day or two, it probably either maybe wasn't up or people were evacuating and leaving. But, but I think it was within, like, the first four to seven days. Um, right. But how much? What was penetration? Da, 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 da. I mean, you did it for I, the I formal stuff. Yeah, but I can't. We I, count packets being moved, you know. Yeah, and I can't really, I don't have data to speak, you know, authoritatively on the, the extent of Wi Fi in the area. Hi, Roland Diamond Cisco. Um, I was involved in some of the uh, logistical relief efforts in the Ninth Ward, New Orleans, uh, over in Algiers. And awesome. The cell phone network was somewhat intact over there, and Verizon Wireless very generously um, donated several um, EBDO cards and accounts, so people use stomp boxes, which are essentially um, EBDO to Wi-Fi bridges. Um, and those proved extraordinarily effective. Where the cell towers were actually up, being able to get connectivity through those, sharing the Wi-Fi out, and then doing VoIP across it so that various first responders and, and other volunteers could communicate via VoIP you know, across, quote, the internet um, was very useful. The problem was in New Orleans itself, of course, the cell phone towers were down, the support equipment was underwater, you know, no, no power facilities, et cetera. So where EVDO uh, was available, it was extremely useful. And then being able to bridge that, as Randy uh, was, uh, was okay. alluding to, into Wi-Fi w was very helpful. It's just that, unfortunately, the cell phone network was down in a good chunk of the area. Yes, yeah, super. Thanks for that observation. I appreciate that. All right. Well, let me see if I can speed through this before it uh, happens again. So I want to thank uh, Renesis for letting me use these graphs. Um, Todd Underwood, of course, was the panel host for the BOF tools, BOF yesterday. So these are some of their slides. So they actually did a pre and post analysis in the Katrina area. So this does cover quite a few states. The top red here is Louisiana, and I don't actually have New Orleans. But this shows about 170 networks totally outed in terms of looking at their autonomous system numbers and their routing activity and so forth, where like Texas is the teal light blue at the bottom, not impacted at all, with Mississippi being pretty hard hit. Um, in terms of a percentage, though, that 170 networks in Louisiana was a pretty small percentage, only about 10 or 13 percent. So they're the red here, although you see that they're trying to keep you know, keep up and they, you know, 
have some, some problems staying up. What will be interesting to see is now, you know, the five months later, are there still businesses that don't have their networks up and don't have, you know, things running at SunGuard or IBM, you know, disaster recovery facilities? Because there are stats that say that 30 to 40 percent of all businesses that have a catastrophic event like this don't have the cash flow to keep going, don't have the staff, they lose expertise, their you know, workers go elsewhere. So um, I would fully expect that some significant number of businesses never recover. And, and when I was there and I just saw, you know, firm after firm with, you know, uh, still um, sheetrock or board on their windows. So, so I, I, I saw hardly any businesses up and running. So six months later, the port is only operating at 50% capacity. There are still over 100,000 100, dial tone lands out. That is primarily because the government hasn't fully decided which neighborhoods will be fixed or repaired and in what order or, you know, on higher ground or how to fix the levees first, et cetera. So they're in somewhat of a holding pattern. So that's um, very unfortunate if you're affected by that. Um, Again, as, as was mentioned, you know, cell phone or cell service is pretty spotty in that local area, but outside of, you know, the New Orleans and Gulf area, not affected. Um, the U.S. Congressional, Congressional Budget Office estimates the repairs at $600 billion, with a B. It's, I think, more appropriate to point out that the insurance industry itself talks about $70 to $75 billion. That's a lot of money. And the way I would see it is you can pay up front, and maybe we as taxpayers, we're all maybe going to somehow pay for the price tag. So money could have been invested in the Gulf area for some of this repair and recovery, or, or not repair and recovery, for the levees up front. So it's, you know, maybe it cost 50 cents before, now it's going to cost $5. You know, I don't know the price tag, but I think I saw $22 billion to fix um, the levees in New Orleans if they're going to start from scratch. I don't know if I have that figure right. That seems so huge. Let me change gears here and talk a little bit about business continuity planning, what's called BCP. The number one goal of business continuity planning is the survival of your institution. So these are all the, the activities that you would need to stay uh, alive and to um, continue to exist. And so these are some of the eight key questions that we should all be asking ourselves, or hopefully your organizations already have. I imagine a lot of us work in data centers, or maybe um, our firms have call centers and so forth. So um, you would first do a business impact analysis, a BIA, which is to say, of all my corporate assets, you know, IT, physical, materials, production, the secret recipe for something, what, what's my, what are my key assets? Because in the middle of a disaster, you can't, be deciding what are my key assets. You have to decide that with upper management way, way, way in advance. And that may be things that are revenue producing or things that allow you to generate a bill so that you can get money in to stay alive. So, uh, you know, it may differ by industry. Um, this uh, chart shows a NIST view. This is NIST 800-34. It's a freely downloaded pub. I would encourage you to look at it. And um, that reconstitution stage is where a lot of New Orleans businesses I talk to are at. So they somehow hobbled themselves, most likely a lot of them went to Houston and Dallas. So they somehow got back online in a week or two and have employees probably flying back and forth every weekend I saw. But now that they've been in the secondary site for five months, that's starting to seem kind of normal, kind of every day, and they don't know how to unwind themselves. So they somehow got themselves there and it was pretty bumpy they don't know really in what order to undo it and, and how to get back to their primary site. So that's um, kind of a challenge for them. The other um, good source of information is Disaster Recovery Journal is at drj.com. Uh, they have hundreds and hundreds of articles that would be helpful. And I actually thought of asking people to raise their hand if they have participated in emergency drills at their sites, but I thought that's like way too scary. So I'm not going to ask that, but I will show this survey. This survey was done by the... Um, IAEM, and I have to look at the name, the International Association of Emergency Managers, and actually it was co-authored or co-funded by AT&T, Ren, so I want to give you your firm credit. And so 62% say that a business continuity plan is important, but um, only 60% of the hundreds of firms interviewed had a plan, and more telling, only 58% of the 60 had tested that plan. 
And really, if you haven't tested a plan of the nature of a disaster like this, you're probably going to have a really difficult time getting on your feet. This last number, the percent who have backup servers, 49%. To me, that would say, well, I am at a single primary site, and I have no diversity, and I'm at total risk. So these were, you know, maybe these weren't Fortune 10 firms, but it was medium to large-sized businesses. So it wasn't, you know, like a mom and pop. These were medium-sized firms, you know, maybe smaller than what we work for, some of us, but definitely a wake-up call. Now, this study was done in the first half of 2005. So this was done pre-Katrina, but a lot of us in more of the security, you know, industry keep talking about wake-up calls, and, and maybe um, it will happen. So in terms of the conclusions that interdependent infrastructure, where we're dependent on fuel, on our labor source, on communication, having food, et cetera, that's all important. And we should really plan for that worst case scenario. Maybe we don't you know, have to practice for the total worst case scenario, but a lot of the people I talked with in New Orleans, um, you, you become sort of immune to, to hurricanes. That You have so many that come by every year that you, you become complacent and you think it's going to be a one or two day minor irritation or it won't even be anything. And so this is the first time that they had ever had mandatory evacuations. So it'll be interesting to see on June 1st, when hurricane season starts again, what that looks like out here. And of course, in order to interoperate, you have to be operating. You have to have power and you have to have people. And a lot of firms didn't have that at 5 in the morning on August 29th. And of course, I didn't search down too much on this, but I, I heard that you know, DNA evidence was lost by the courts. Healthcare records lost, et cetera. So a lot of people maybe not meeting their compliance requirements in terms of data backup. But all in all, it, it is a catastrophic event, and you have to be flexible. I think you know more could have been done uh, on the part of government and industry. But I think all in all, um, you know you just have to be flexible with what comes your way. So again, as I said, that public internet vision certainly was realized. So um, thank you. At this point, I'll take, um, I don't know if I have time. I, I imagine I've gone over my time. I have gone over my time. So um, I'll be on the panel and answer questions with the rest of the panel members. Thank you so much for your time.